chapter 3. We're in the early stages of Jesus' ministry. It continues on, but we see that he's having this, this battle with these religious people um, versus those that are truly seeking Jesus in relationship. And, and so these religious people, their religion is getting in the way of their relationship with God. And they are, in a sense, worshiping their rules, their group, their clique, and they're missing out on the heart of God. And we look at these people and we think, oh, man, they're jerks. But the problem with that, you know, judging them is it's our human nature to, to have that click, to be them and us. And it's really our human nature to kind of hide what's happening inside to present the good that's happening outside. We, we all suffer with that. We all put on a facade. And, and Facebook is a great thing to hide behind, you know. So I don't know it's, if it's drawn us closer or actually gotten us further apart. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about discipleship this morning. So last time that we were together uh, in, in uh, the book of Mark, Jesus, uh, they, they were trying to trap Jesus. These legalists were trying to trap him, breaking their law. And remember, they had brought in a man with a withered hand into the synagogue on the Sabbath. And so they know Jesus' heart by this point. They can count on his character. What's he going to do when he sees someone with a withered hand? He's going to have compassion on them, and he's going to heal them. And they know it. And so they trap him healing someone on a Sabbath. And Jesus said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? Now, these guys are always just, you, you think they'd learn the first time, right? When Jesus responds and catches them in their foolishness, in their darkened hearts, catches them in a sense with their spiritual pants down. Because they, he, he always shows that they, they're missing the spirit of the law by following just the letter of the law. And that's what they kept on doing. And so it's like having someone in the church that, that has tattoos and, and doesn't have the nicest clothes, but they're really seeking the Lord. And then it's having that person that ties faithfully and they're dressed all nice and they're, they're a good, I guess, trophy for the church, but they're not walking with God and they never really pray, right? Which one is really closer to God? And so these, these guys are not close to God at all. And they keep on trying to catch Jesus on this law of the Sabbath, which is ridiculous, right? Because the Sabbath represents Jesus. Jesus is the Sabbath. He is our rest. The Sabbath is put there to point to Jesus in the Ten Commandments. To, the, the most important commandment is to know our Sabbath, Jesus Christ. And so when he came and he died for our sins, we enter into our rest. We no longer follow the law. We are in Jesus, and it's just, a, it's just this incredible relief that we have. And so a, a, am I a, a, a Sabbath worshiper? Absolutely. Yeah, because I live there. Do I worship the Lord on Sundays? Yeah. Mondays? Yeah. Tuesdays? Yeah. I, I've walked into a whole Sabbath. And so they're, they're telling him he's breaking the Sabbath, and, and he's basically telling them at one point to this point, Mark, he says, I wrote that law. And the reason I wrote that law is for man to enjoy me, for man to enjoy God, not to oppress man. You're, you're serving a day. You're, 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 you're not serving God. You're not enjoying it. You're, 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 you're harming people with this gift of the Sabbath. And he is, he claimed to be the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the living Sabbath. He created the Sabbath, and they're trying to catch him in the Sabbath. And it's just an, it, it just kind of blows your mind when you really look at it that way. The, these guys are just foolish, and we're going to see how foolish they are in a little bit. So Mark chapter 13, or excuse me, 3, verse 13, it says, And he went up on the mountain, and he called those that he himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed the twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. And so he appoints the 12 that they may be with him. And when, he, when it says that they might be with him, the idea in, in, the, in the verb that they might be with him, the idea behind that is they were continually with him. He's calling them to true discipleship. He's calling them to himself. 
that he might send them out, that they might be sent out ones. And, and the word is where we get a word apostle. And so a sent out one is an apostle. So they first need to be with him so that they can then be sent out and then with power. And, and so we're going we're gonna to look at that, right? And so if you want to serve Jesus and go out and be effective with power, you need to be with Jesus first and spending time with him. And, and I do encourage you, I, I think a lot about, obviously, the church. It's, it's what I do, but it's, all, it's what we all do. And I was speaking with another pastor just yesterday, and he was asking me about church. And, and I told him, I said, at least in my capacity, I stopped trying to make a huge church. Because when you're young and ambitious, it's like, well, an, an American, it's got to be bigger, it's more successful. And then as I've gotten older, I've realized that, that church is so much about relationship. And, and at the same time, if, God build, if, if, if man builds a house, if it's not God building it, he who builds that house builds it in vain. And, and so the Lord knows my capacity as a pastor. He knows our leadership's capacity, our, our our, our elders' capacity to minister at a level, and he knows what brings us joy and fulfillment in ministering to the people, and he knows when he brought you here as a member of this church and the Lord led you here as a part of the family, what you needed to be a part of, good, bad, and ugly, right? The, the, the stresses and the, and the sparks that sometimes fly and the oddities and the whatever, but, but this is God's plan that we might be together and growing together in this place. It's his church and it's his plan. But he wants us to live life and experience life together and to be together. So he calls them to be with him. And that means they're going to be traveling with him in the summer, in the winter. They're going to be camping on the side of the road with him. They're going to be going to the market with him. They're going to be walking and they're hungry. What do we do? <laughs> they're they're going to see him in all these situations when he's having conflict, when he's having great victory. They're going to be with him, and that is true discipleship. And that is that togetherness that God wants. And one of the hard things about being in America is, is in the 50s when, when air conditioning became popular, what did we start doing? We stayed in our houses instead of going outside and knowing our neighbors, Right? And the church, being in this culture and society with air conditioning, we started to separate further and further out from each other. So now we have to be very intentional and purposeful in this idea of discipleship and living life with one another. Even though it's uncomfortable, it is healthy, and it's what needs to happen in the church. And so the church isn't a place where you come and you're entertained and you observe Christianity. It's meant to be a place where you come and you live Christianity with one another. And that is what we need to do. And in our church, you need to understand, us building a coffee shop is not because 20 years ago, coffee shops, every church, every good church, growing church, had to have a coffee shop. That's not the purpose. Even if we're out of coffee, that place still has a purpose. It's not just to get caffeinated, which I have no problem with, right? But, but it, is, it is a place where, where people can more easily gather. When, when we designed this church, it was on the back of a napkin at a meeting with two other guys, and, and it wasn't totally thought out. And, and then we, we gave it to a guy, and we gave him like $10,000, and he just basically made it legal. <laughs> I'm like, no, you're supposed to tell us what's going to work and not work, right? And so we didn't create it enough room for, for fellowship. And so as our heart has grown as a church, as we've matured as a church, we just realize it's not me speaking and you observing and listening. Yeah, that's a part of it. That's Sunday, but probably the least effective as far as intimate personal growth. Because one, it comes with you and God at home. That's where your growth comes from. And two, it, it comes with you being willing to step out and minister to the less mature or the hurting, or you being willing to come when you're hurting, being ministered to and open yourself up, and being discipled and ministered to by those that are more mature as well. We all need to be in that process. I have mentors that really speak into my life. I was so blessed. We had a board meeting yesterday, and uh, two guys that I just look up to. One I call my, my older brother, Lance Cook. He's on our board of trustees. And another, Ken Maryhew, is one of the most faithful guys, Calvary Chapel of, of uh, Oklahoma City. And we fellowshiped for two hours and called it a board meeting. 
<laughs> right? You know, and they're just, they, they pour into my life. They're always, so I need this as well. And so this process of church, we've really got to re, 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 rethink it all the time because what do we do? I've gone to church. No, you are church. Everywhere you go, you're it. And, and, and so it's that openness and the willingness, but all of us are so practiced in putting up the facade, right? The Facebook page and cleaning up for Sunday mornings. And it's okay, smell good on Sunday mornings. I'm good with it, right? But that's not all it is, right? But these guys were, were all about the facade. But what Jesus does is he tells the guys that he's chosen, come live with me. Come experience everything with me. I know if our church was to grow, I know my capacity. So if our church grew to be a thousand people, you know what I'd have to do? I'd have to find a lot of people that are better at administration than I am. And it's their calling and their gifting. And I'd have so that I could still hang out with the people. Because that's what I am. And that's where my capacity lies. You see what I'm saying? Uh, you know, and, and so that ministry needs to take place. And so we personally, though, don't have that ability to spend the physical time with Jesus. But if we want to be effective in other people's lives and be a discipler and be a disciple, we need to take the time to spend time with Jesus and to also spend time with those that are more mature than us with Jesus as well, right? Discipleship, that togetherness. And so we need to spend that time with him. And, and he has called us. He's called us all kinds of incredible things, right? He's called you a, a brother or a sister. He's called you his child. He's called you his friend. And he died to develop that relationship with you. You didn't have it. You didn't have access to it. You had sort of a shadow of an access to it through animal sacrifices. But when Jesus came and he died and he rose again, he completely opened that access door for us to have fellowship with him. And so I, personally, I believe the greatest gift and the greatest work we can give back to God in a physical sense is spending time with him as his sibling, as his child, and as his friend. And he wants to enjoy you. So even as he calls these 12 and he says, come with me. You know what he does? When you get saved, he's immediately saying, come with me. Come with me. And, and for me, if I haven't been spending time with Jesus, I'm a different person than when I have been spending consistent time with Jesus. And my family will testify. <laughs> you know? and, and the thing is, when I'm spending time with Jesus... I'm, live, I'm not living me. I'm living beyond me. You know what I mean? I'm starting to take on his character more and more. I'm more filled with the Spirit. I'm more motivated. And, and, and I have that peace and that joy and that contentment. When I'm not with Jesus, I start being me. And I don't like me. I don't think my, my wife likes me. My children certainly don't like the real me. But, but who I am in Jesus is who I'm becoming, who he's declared me to be in heaven, and I need to spend time with him. And so he invites you in as his disciple. So Paul learned in his ministry from Jesus, and he offered them to others. Do you have stuff to give to others? You know, it's incredible. I study the word of God all the time, right? That's my gig, right? But... When I spend time with Jesus in the morning, it's more likely that what I spend time in devotionally, I'm going to use, whether it's out at the beach witnessing to somebody or whether it's in my office counseling somebody. Those things I pick up in that personal time with Jesus, I don't know why it works that way, but it does. But I think it's just such that quality time that my, my study time is my study time, but my personal time with Jesus is my discipleship time. See what I'm saying? It is just so important to be discipled by him directly first. Right? So Paul says about communion, he says, for I received from the Lord, now I give it to you. And later on, he says, I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins. So the gospel, he's, he's taught it again and again. So I've received this from God and I want to give it away. And, and that comes through meeting with Jesus. So Jesus, when he spent time with his disciples, he also told them what? 
uh, excuse me, the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Go make disciples, not converts, disciples, followers of Jesus, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What? Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded to you. So I've given it to you. Now you teach it to them. And what is the best way to learn? How do you learn? Well, first of all, you observe, and then you try it with oversight, and then you're on your own. And that's how discipleship happens, right? Now, officially, some of you have been a teacher, some of you are teachers in here, but I've been a teacher. And so what do I do? I do it on the board first. Then I have them write it down and practice it, and then I tell them, go do your homework. I used to teach math. Go do your homework. And that's how we learn. But that is also the process of discipleship, which means what? You're either a teacher at a given time or you're a learner at a given time. Our whole life needs to be discipleship, not just shut down in our houses. And we live it. And one of the reasons I just so love biblical counseling is that I get to be one-on-one -on -one and directly see the power of the effect of God's word in someone's life. And I love to see lives changed. Every time I get involved in a new ministry, it's like, I could do this for a living. Man, I could do this. This is awesome because God's moving, right? You, you, if you go on this mission trip with us, you're going to go, I want to be a, a Casas de Cristo missionary. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I have no right with any power tool, right? But, but it's like all of a sudden I think, I could do this. This is awesome. And then we lead some men out of uh, pornography addiction. And then they have victory, and you're like, oh, forget everything else. I could do this, <laughs> you know? Or, or you counsel a marriage back to health, and you're like, sign me up. I love seeing this happen. God's awesome. You lead someone to Christ. Oh, I'm an evangelist. Watch out, Greg Laurie. Watch out. I'm the next Billy Graham, right? Because it's just so awesome to be used by God. But he teaches you, and you get to teach others. Man, let that be your lifestyle. That is the heart of our church, again, I'm the most visible part of our church, but I am not our church. Jesus is the center of our church, and every single one of you are important in our church. And, and regardless of your temperament, regardless of your, your gifting or whatever, God has you to be in the kingdom of God for a very good purpose. And, and the awesome thing for me is I learn from everybody. I learn in prayer meetings, I, I, you know, and it's just so we're all a part of this, and discipleship is so important. I'm, again, I'm going tangent wide, sorry. Um, so we are all called to go out and be disciplers, make disciples. And so this process of discipleship persists. It belongs to us. What did Paul tell Timothy? He said, Therefore, you, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul, an apostle, right? And I believe capital A, apostle. Timothy, what is Timothy? He's just a pastor. Oh, but he's still a pastor. But who are these other guys? Just faithful men. They have no title. They didn't say they're elders. Just faithful men, right? Therefore, you, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these also to regular old faithful men, right? God loves the faithful, or God can use the faithful, who will be able to teach others also. And then we see this in the life of Paul. Everywhere that Paul went, it's like, hey, come on, come with me. And I need to remember to do this more. The other day, we had a, a, a funeral, and it was a funeral for a, a guy in his young 30s. And he had attended church here on and off over the years, and I, and I, I knew him. And uh, he had a, a seizure, and, and he passed away suddenly. But his daughter, his sister, and his nephew came to visit me in the office. And I'm thinking, that's a heavy situation. I'm comfortable, not comfortable in the sense of goody-goody, but comfortable in those situations. I've comforted the bereaved hundreds if not thousands of times right it's kind of what i do but i'm thinking this is a difficult situation and so i called younger men in our church unfortunately i didn't do it early enough but i called younger men in our church and i said hey 
I have, I have an appointment this afternoon. Would you please come? And they're like, oh, man, I'm at work or whatever. You know, so I didn't do it early enough. My bad. But I'm thinking, I, I want to think more like Paul because I want them to be with me, observe. And then maybe sometime they will actually co be comforting a family and they can ask me questions and then they're able to do it on their own. That's discipleship, right? And so everywhere Paul went, there's Sopater, a Berea. So he picked him up there. That's over in Greece. There's also Aristarchus and Segundus of the Thess uh, Thessalonians. And then Gaius of Derby, place where they make hats. Timothy, Tychicus of Trometheus of Asia. And so all over this area of, of Asia Minor and what we know of Greece today, he starts picking up guys. Timothy, Aquila, Priscilla, Apollos, all these people he ministered to over the time and all the people that he discipled when he was in Antioch and just on and on and on. Like Paul just loved to, to, to disciple men. He took it very seriously and, and he found great joy in that. So Jesus calls them to be with him, to learn, to be sent out again and to have power. Power is delegated authority. And, and, the, and the awesome thing is, I can't, but he can. I walk into crazy situations. And I'm not comfortable walking into hard situations. But I do have an expectation that God wants me to go into a hard situation, therefore he's gonna empower me to take care of the situation. So I go in with confidence, even with fear and trepidation. <laughs> you, see, you understand what I'm saying? So get a phone call, 11 o'clock at night, there's been a motorcycle accident. Someone's asking for you down here at the emergency room. Now, seriously, this, this happened once. I, I was called to the emergency room and they're taking me back, and this particular emergency room, I think it was Doctors Regional, um, they have sheets hanging down, but they didn't have walls blocking, and, and they actually had drains in the ground on the tile floor. I don't know if it's still like that. So I walk in, and as they're taking me back, they go, sir, wait here, I, I, I wanna see if they're ready for you. So I'm standing there, and I'm watching blood drip from underneath one of the curtains into a drain. It's a lot of blood. And I'm thinking, I ain't going in that room. That's not the room you're going to take me in, God. I'm not prepared for this, right? And that's exactly where they took me, into that room. So beyond myself. At the same time, God knew what he wanted and he empowered me to handle the situation well. No, you can't train someone for that. You can give them Bible verses and try to teach them, but, but, but God sent me in there equipped even though I had no clue that I was equipped, but with faith, right? And so he trains me as much as he can, but then he sends me out with his power. How cool is that? He sent in... And, and, You've got powers, okay? <laughs> you need to understand God can use you above yourself, above and beyond your, what you think you can be used. Let it be known to you all and the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, God raised up from the dead. By him, this man stands before you whole. Peter's speaking to the Sanhedrin and he's going, it ain't me, guys. I can't do nothing. I'm a fisherman. I, I might be able to sew a few nets together and catch some fish, but that's about it. That's my talent pool. But Jesus did this. But Peter was willing to allow the power of God to move through him. Romans 15, 18, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders and the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and round about to Acrylium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. So he's saying, I'm not taking credit for this. I've done it. I was there. I watched it happen, and I was amazed. It's the power of God. And I want you to note something here, and I always like to bring this up. It says, to make the Gentiles obedient. And then it talks about signs and wonders. 
Signs and wonders, as soon as they occur, and, and they're great. I, I love for the Lord to work through me in that way. Even healings. All those things are still temporary, right? Because as soon as a sign takes place, it's now gone. Because it's pointing to which is eternal, but the sign is not eternal. It's just a thing, right? And, and a healing, even a healing is awesome. It gets to last a lot longer than a sign. But a healing, everybody gets healed in the Bible, from what I can tell, died. Right? So a healing is even temporary. But what is eternal when he talks about the power? He puts it, I, I like the priority here. He says, make the Gentiles obedient. Because with a word, God can heal things. People, whatever. He can fix things. He can speak the galaxies. He spoke the universe into creation. But in order to make Gentiles obedient, he had to hurt himself, and he had to go to the cross. God in the flesh died for me. But that's part of the power of God, isn't it? And when someone gets saved, we always say, I want to see the miracles. Man, I want to see people saved. And if it takes miracles to get there, awesome. But the goal is the salvation of people, right? Because when they get saved, how long does that last? Eternity, right? And that's the most expensive thing that God ever did. It, it, he had to buy it with the purchase of Jesus Christ's blood. You know, so, but Paul says, it's all through Jesus. It's all through Jesus. But I got power, and I'm confident in my power. You know, there goes Pastor Rod. He's confident. I ain't confident in me at all. I'm a loser. But it's the power of God in me, and I've got power, and I'm excited about that. Isn't that awesome? Do we need that in this world? Does this world need that from you? This world absolutely needs us to be on fire. Whether they know it or not, they absolutely do. They need us to, to be filled with the power of God. But we have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellence of the power might be of God and not of us. You know, so often when God's using us in a great way, we're reminded, yeah, he's God, I'm me. Thank you for using me, right? And then Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. I can't, I can't do something that I haven't thought about doing, right? But God does beyond what I can even think about doing. So obviously it has to be God because I can't even think of it, right? Like it's beyond me. And it happens all the time if you're walking in obedience to God. How cool it is. So... Was it last weekend I wasn't here? Yeah, so we, we had the opportunity uh, as a family um, to go up to Sendeo, and Sendeo, our prison ministry, they are about to start receiving any day uh, clients into their transition home. So everything's going to change. And they're my kids, right? I mean, they're from this church, and I'm their pastor, and, and I'm, you know, I, I love them like kids, right? And, and so it's like, okay, I got to get away. I want to spend some time with them. I know it's this critical time and, and everything. And so I went up there, and uh, we had a sweet, neat time. We had some other friends from Oklahoma there and had some worship and everything. And, and, and as we're, you know, we're talking about the ministry, we also did a bunch of painting, painted for maybe 15 hours or whatever, trying to, I uh, don't know. I think we make more mistakes. I think we go backwards every time we paint for them <laughs> because we make more of a mess than I think we help. But anyway, so we're, you know, so it was a work trip as well uh, with my family, but just really wanting to spend time before this critical time. But one of the things I was able to do, I was able to bring this guy named Bill Holdridge. Bill Holdridge spoke here a few months ago, and he is one of my mentors. But Bill Holdridge is a pastor to hundreds of pastors. But he recently moved to Tyler, which is about an hour north of where Sandeo is. And so I so wanted to connect Larry and Hannah and, um, and Debbie, their assistant, with Bill and his, his wife, Sherry. And it, it, it was always hit and miss the last three trips we've been up there. So finally, this time he comes, and um, it was such a blessing. For about two or three hours, they just sat in awe in a room, watching Hannah and Larry, who are very ordinary. You know, I call them modern-day hippies. Pretty good, right? Modern-day hippies. <laughs> and uh, they're just... Normal, relaxed people, you know, Larry has severe uh, uh, dyslexia. Great Bible teacher, but he, you know, he struggles to read. Um, but he can fix anything, which is crazy. Uh, but just really ordinary, normal people. And all they were was obedient. And they're ministering to at least nine to 10,000 women 
in the Texas state prison system multiple times a year. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of women are receiving Bible studies. They're being discipled through this ministry. And it's so funny because it's just Hannah and Larry. And they know it's just them like, oh, whatever, you know, like. And it's so cool. And I was, I was watching this man that watches and, and knows all these things countrywide and worldwide. He has his, his, his finger on the pulse of things going on. And, and hundreds of pastors go to Bill Holdridge for advice and stuff like that. And it was so cool to watch Bill just start going. And then I watch his wife just get more and more and more excited about what's happening. And later on, I was talking to Bill and like Bill's looking at me, and he's like, this ministry came out of your church? Are you kidding me? No, he didn't say that, but I kind of felt it from him, you know, like, who are you? And I'm like, right, that's exactly right, isn't it? It's exactly right. Who are we? But earthen vessels containing the power of God. You know what Billy Graham would say? He'd say it in a different way, but he would say the same thing as me. If Chuck Smith were here today... He would just go, I don't know. God just likes to work. He didn't feel like he was anything special. And it's just so funny. I'd want to get all this wisdom out of Chuck whenever I got a, t a chance to talk to him. And Chuck used to surf when he was younger, and he knows I'm a surfer, and he'd always want to talk about surfing with me. You know, Rod, I used to surf Huntington Pier back in the day. <laughs> you know, like, come on, let's talk theological, you know. But he's like, just a humble guy. But so are we, and God wants to go work through us. And the thing is, if God reaches one person through you, if you disciple your children well or your grandchildren well, who knows? Remember Andrew. He's not a big, you know, the big shot in the apostles. But who did he bring to the Lord? He brought Peter. How cool is that? How would you like to be the guy that led Billy Graham to Christ? Yeah, okay. I'll take it. So often when we pray people out of here, it's like, I'm praying for you so we can get some of the credit when you do awesome things for God, right? And it's so true. It's just, just obedience, whatever. And, and God never lets your good work, your sacrifice, your, your surrender go, go unrewarded either. He sees it. And again, the great value is not being a really empty, big drum that you can bang on and make a loud noise because that drum is empty. It doesn't have any value. You want to be the drum that's full, and you can bang on it. It may not be very loud, but it's valuable. That's the content of the power that God wants to put in us as we become our disciple, or as we become his disciples and as we are sent out and as we are trained and, and we allow his power to work through us. And I'm not going to finish the study today, <laughs> so we'll cut off early. Anyway, so Mark um, chapter 3, verse 16, it goes on, it says, Simeon, to whom he gave the name Peter. So this is a list of those that he called to himself to, to send out and to empower whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bonanerges, which is the sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Bartholomew also called Nathaniel, Matthew, Levi, Thomas, means twin, James, the son of Alphaeus, who also went by the name Judas, but this is not Judas Iscariot, this is another Judas, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him, and they went into a house. And so he, he calls these men, he gives them nicknames, he's going to be with them and, and minister to them. He calls James and, and John, sons of thunder, their brothers, and they were young and fiery. So one time, you know, people weren't so nice to Jesus, and what happens? You know, James and John, like, let's call fire down on them. And Jesus is like, I didn't come to call fire down. I came to save them, right? But I can relate. And I, I, I look at who I was when I was younger, and then I look at everything God's done, and I realize he still has a lot more to do, but man, I'm a way different guy. Praise God. You know, I, I remember right after I rededicated my heart to the Lord, my parents had been walking with the Lord for, I don't know, 45 years. My dad was like 
awesome man of God. And I, I was basically going, like, you guys are barely saved. <laughs> you know? <laughs> my mom just, <laughs> later on, you know, after quite a bit of humbling, my mom just laughed at me, you know, like, oh my gosh, right? But they were sons of thunder, he called them. But he rebuked them and he says, do, you do not know what manner of spirit you are. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. But I, I do love that about Jesus. Why? He continues to change us. And I love that. I love that. There's, there's some people in this church around you, sitting around you right now. And if they told you your, their, their story, they'd go, or you'd go, no, I, I don't believe that. No, not you. No. Why? Because God's changed. That's what he does. He transforms people's lives, right? And, and, and you know, my wife, she could give her testimony. You'd go, uh, no, not you. No, no, that's not you. And, and, and we have these stories, right? But he changes lives. He continually does that. And, and it started with them being with Jesus. Verse 20, then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. They're they're hungry. They don't even have time to eat, one translation says of it. But Jesus said this. They went out of the city and they came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. He hadn't eaten. And what does he say? I have food to eat which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And so... This doesn't say, oh, don't eat anymore. <laughs> it's not saying don't eat food, but it's saying, are you in a place where you are absolutely fulfilled by serving God? When you serve God, do you get to the point where you might forget to eat? And, and when you're just rolling? Hey, if you, if you, you'll experience, if you go to Acuna, you're going to be physically working all day, and you'll, you'll, is, is it lunchtime already? Because you're doing, you're, you're, your spirit is so fulfilled and satisfied at the moment, right? And, and what happens is you, you change your appetite when you walk with the Lord and you serve him and you create new pathways to pleasure and joy in your mind. And it's no longer the world that gives you pleasure and joy. It's the things of the Lord that bring you satisfaction. And... Then it goes on. So they're unable to eat. The, the ministry is happening. Verse 21. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem says, he has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. So his own people literally means, we'll see later, that it's his family. They're hearing what's going on, and they're going, he's always had the Messiah complex. Oh, Mr. Perfect, whatever. Mary knew, but his brothers didn't know. His siblings didn't know at that point in time who he really was. You know, could you imagine being Jesus' half-little brother? Why can't you be more like Jesus? There's a theological answer to that. <laughs> you know, I have a problem because he's God in the flesh, you know. Come on, Mom. You knew this, Mom. But anyway, so... so but, but some of his family members are really worried about him. And I'm sure Mary's worried about him because all this hoopla, she's hearing about you know, him rebuking the Pharisees and the crowds, what's going to happen to him. And she has a mother's heart too. But anyways, his own people, they, they hear about this and, and rumors going, he thinks he's the Messiah. He's rebuking the Pharisees. He's forgiving people's sins. It's wild what's going on. And so they take the trip down to go see him. But the Pharisees are, are, are trying to, the religious leaders see him as a threat, and they're, they're trying to write him off. I want to encourage you guys, especially in the environment where we're at today. Number one, your, your biggest priority is to know Jesus and be his child and to be close to him. But please, don't let your Christian walk just stop there. Because all of you have interests beyond, you know, your, your morning devotion time, right? So some people are really into prophecy. Well, awesome. Get into it and help the rest of us. But some of you know all about the difference between Mormonism 
and Christianity, because maybe you came from a Mormon home or you have Mormon friends, study that and teach us and help us. Let us be an educated church that can give reasonable answers. Uh, for me, you know, I love the logic and, and the, the philosophical uh, type arguments that you know, prove the existence of God and, and, and these various things and, and certain things in the scriptures and you know, how to logically interpret a scripture how it fits in context and stuff like that. So I like doing that. That's my kind of extra credit. I spend time with Jesus, and, and then when I have extra time, I'll listen to apologetic podcasts. That's what I like to do, apologetics. And so we all have these things. But the problem is with the church, we, we get settled, and we're just okay with being saved. The problem is what you're seeing here is these guys have authority. They're religious rulers. They're, they're in their culture, they're leaders. They, they have the respect of the people. And then they say this ridiculous statement. Satan, he's full of Satan, and, and he casts out demons by Satan. Now, if they're uneducated, if they're not thinking, they're going to go, oh no, oh no, they're, they're saying this, I, I don't know what to do. But if they're thinking, they're going to go, that's so dumb. So, so what am I saying? We're living in a culture where people that have positions of authority are saying ludicrous things. And we need to be able to recognize why they're wrong so we don't freak out and we're able to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. Right? So when they say, just last week, I'm reading an article, and, and, and they're saying, in hospitals, in order not to offend people with their identities, when they give a baby back to somebody, they no longer say breastfeeding, they say chest feeding in case the man wants to breastfeed the baby. Okay. That's, and they call it science. And if you deny it, you're against science. It's... It's wild. But the thing is, we need to be educated enough to know what God thinks of us. What does God think of racism? He created everybody in his image for fellowship with him for all of eternity, and he died for everybody. And yet, racism has been in the church in the past. Does it belong? Absolutely not. Absolute sin. Absolute. Just call it out for what it is, right? It's wrong. We're not, we're not a respecter of, of man in that sense where we lift up one over another, you know? Absolutely sinful. So when, you know, when, when Chelsea Clinton, whoever she is, calls me a racist just because of the lack of pigment in my skin, I'm like, oh no, I must be. But what does God call me? What, what has God proclaimed I am? You see what I'm saying? Like, we don't have to buy into it. Are you a hater because you want to protect the most innocent among us, the child in the womb, who has a completely set, different set of DNA than, than the host? Right? The, 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 the child's DNA is the child's DNA. It isn't the mother's DNA. How many of you have exactly the same blood type as both of your parents? Or as your mother, let's just say your mother. Most don't. M many times we have different blood types, right? Doctors in the room, nurses. How does that happen if, if that is just a part of your mother's body? My mom's a female, I'm a male. How does that happen? I'm not, so from the time I was conceived, I'm an individual, but I haven't committed any sin at that point in time. And so to take away that life is, is not a good thing. But let's let those that are actually guilty of things out of prison and kill those that have never committed a crime in the womb. Right? And I'm, don't get me started on the criminal justice system. <laughs> if it works, I'm all for it. When it doesn't work and you got corrupt people that manipulate it, I'm not, you know, it's, it's a mess anyway. So I want to have compassion on everybody. But what I'm saying is, why is it so backwards? We should not get caught up in that. 
we as Christians need to be educated and understand lovingly why a Mormon is not a Christian. Why a Jehovah's Witness, with all their knowledge and their ability to trip us up, is in very much spiritual danger. You know, so, so politically we need to understand why something is right and why something is wrong. See what I'm saying? As, as Christians, especially during this time, we need to be willing and able to give an answer with gentleness and respect. And the way that you give an answer with gentleness and respect is you know the answer. If not, you just get defensive and you start backpedaling and you might attack them back as much as they're attacking you instead of being able to go, yeah, let's stop. Do you want an answer for that? Because if you want one, I've, I've actually thought through that. And you, know, so, and you can talk to them and try to win them for Christ, right? So with, with gentleness and respect. So that's happening here. So these people with authority, and you can imagine the uneducated amongst them, the non-thinkers are going, oh, maybe he has a demon. But he just healed a bunch of people. He's, he knows the word of God. He is the word of God. He's doing these incredible things. He's rebuking these Pharisees who drive us crazy. And man, he is awesome. I was there when he was baptized. You know, the voice from heaven, the, the, the dove, and just this crazy. And like, oh my gosh, like he is God. And then someone says, you know, he has a, he's, he's from Satan and he's casting out demons by Satan's power. Oh no, no. It's an illogical statement. And Jesus responds that way. He tells them what? He says in verse 23, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, how can, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan is risen up against himself and is divided, he, not, he cannot stand but has an end. How or even why would Satan cast out Satan? His goal is to destroy the person he's possessing, but then he's going to save the person he's possessing? It's an absolute ludicrous statement, right? But unless you're watching for it, unless you're prepared, you're alert, you're aware, and you're really based well in, in, in the word of God, you can be deceived. And a lot of Christians are deceived today. And, and, and I'm not saying, oh, you need to all get degrees or whatever. I'm just saying, go with what the Lord's laying upon your heart above and beyond your personal daily devotions and become an expert and, and expert us on it. Again, I, you know, I'm, I, I love prophecy, but at a time I had to set it aside because it, it so absorbed me that I got distracted by it, right? So I study it, I watch it, but I got to be careful with it. Apologetics for me is one of those things I can do and it doesn't get in my way, right? But, but become an expert and allow the, go be above and beyond and think, okay, well, maybe I should read this book. Maybe I should listen to this podcast. Maybe I should listen to this particular teacher in this particular area. I have a, I have a neighbor who's a, you know, a whatever, you know, false doctrine. I don't know why it's wrong. But research it and become knowledgeable because then you'll be able to answer these types of things. And, and Jesus just flat out just says, no. That's not how it works. Satan would never do that because he would be destroying himself. And it makes much sense to us as we read it, right? But then he goes on and says, and no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and he will plunder the house. So as Jesus does, he goes a little bit further, doesn't he? And you know what he's saying there? He's saying, I'm coming into Satan's realm and I'm casting him out. It ain't Satan casting him out. Why would he do that? That's dumb. But he's saying, I'm stronger than Satan. You see that? I'm the strong man. He's gone, and he isn't doing it to himself. That's dumb. He's gone. These people have had demons cast out because I did it. And he's clearly giving them the answer. He is stronger. So Satan's kingdom at this point in time is still around. I don't know God's rules, how he set them up with uh, I mean, I guess someday I'm going to be able to ask him if I think of it. I don't think I'll think of it then. I'll be going, whoa, uh, 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 you know, like, I don't think I'll, like, Jesus, why did you let Satan run free for so long? But he has his purposes in it, for sure. He's not purposeless. But it's not divided. It, it, it's still strong. Jesus himself said, the thief does not come except to still kill and destroy. That's Satan. He's, he was active in Jesus' life.
But Peter warns the church in his general epistle, 1 Peter 5, 8, he says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now again, I, 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 I love to remind you of this. We see possessed people, that's scary, that's weird and everything. But Satan's greatest power or the, 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 the fallen angels' de- uh, greatest power, demons, is not possessing people. It's casting thoughts into people's minds like he did to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. Right? He can put those thoughts in people's minds. He's the prince of the power of the air. How? He casts thoughts into people's minds. He's very powerful on this earth. How? You get someone with authority that doesn't know God, who isn't protected, who isn't aware of the battle. And what does Satan do? He casts a thought into their mind. Like... The best thing or one of the greatest goods that taxpayers should pay for all over the world is to promote abortion. They put that into, he puts that into people's mind. Who thinks that's a good idea? Any logical person that loves babies isn't going to think that's a good idea. But you have mothers marching around that already have kids with signs that say, you know, like uh, pro, they're pro-abortion signs, right? Pro-choice, they call it. Baby has no choice. But, but they call it pro-choice. And it's all, and you're negative, and you're trying to... How does that happen? And, and how can they say, you know, the, the, again, the, the latest thing? A man can be a woman. And, and they're starting to put feminine hygiene products in men's restrooms. Like... That's from Satan, because these people are college-educated people, sometimes from Harvard, right? Like, are you kidding me? Where, does he, where do these ideas come from? Satan. They can't happen to us, but this is where we need to guard. We need to be on battle, as it says in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm not going to read through it, but we have weapons of warfare that are very practical, and they all come down to, to our, our spiritual fundamentals, right, and, 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 and prayer. And so we do need to be aware that we're in this war. And, and we're going to close with, with this idea here. As you spend time with the Lord, as you prepare yourself for action, as you equip yourself, we are not meant to run away from Satan, and we're not meant just to protect ourselves. Because the weapons of the warfare are are all in the front. They're not in the back. When you turn around, you're vulnerable. When you're moving forward, you're protected with the armor of God. You move forward. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Gates are a defensive thing. And these gates that Jesus talks about are the gates of hell. So what are we supposed to do? We're the ones that are supposed to be busting in against Satan's kingdom. Man, are we in a state to be able to do that? But here's the thing. We are, because we are equipped. And remember, you've got powers. So every time a marriage is healed, God's using me to steal from Satan. Because Satan wants to destroy what God put together. Every time a man is freed from pornography, that man is meant to be a leader in in the culture and in the church and if he has a family, in his family. And, and, And as he recovers, this bad thing now becomes a good thing because he can now help others. I mean, one of the reasons we got into it is because 10 years ago, I had a battle with pornography myself. And I came out of that and God ministered to me and then like, Four years later, I'm like, let's turn this around. I had a failure. Let's make this a victory. And, and, and we had one of our elders just really pushing and, and, and bringing this into a church. So now we're able to set people free. What are we doing? We're stealing from Satan. We're, we're opening the gates of hell. Right? This is what we want to do. When a, when a woman is convinced not to have an abortion, we've ripped Satan off, right? 
when, when a couple that's been living together, they, they, they come into the church and, and, and you know, they, they, they get saved and then we look at them and go, okay, here's the deal. You know, you can be saved and still in sin, but God wants to bring absolute blessing into your life. So let's go through some counseling. Let's separate and let's get you guys married the right way before God. You know what? Bam! There goes that door. When you raise up your children and give them the greatest opportunity to walk with God, it all, doesn't always happen, right? But if you give them the greatest opportunity, you know what you're doing? You're ripping Satan off. You're a warrior, right? You're equipped, and it doesn't, you can have the softest, most gentlest. You may be a petite, you know, older woman, but you know what? You get to knock down the gates of hell with the power that God has given you, and he wants to do it through you. And this is how we work. And the, the funny thing is, we're not to be up in people's face. We're to do it with love, right? But God, this is what God does. He didn't come into the world to condemn the world. It's already going to hell. He came into the world to save the world. And this is the incredible opportunity for such a time as this. We're going to go ahead and celebrate in communion uh, and we will pick up where we left off. I rarely do that, but most of the time I push through, but I never, I never know. Sometimes I bat off more and I can chew, and then I get all excited and I keep on talking, so sorry about that. <laughs> but um, we're going to celebrate in communion, and so what we're going to do is we're going to have the worship team come on up, and uh, voila, they are here. <laughs> and, uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time worshiping, and as we worship, the purpose of this time is just to bring everything back to center. And, and I always like to liken it to a, you know, you, the Lord's a potter, you're the clay. It's in the Bible, right? And if you've ever thrown clay or, or thrown a pot, you put it on a wheel. I did this in high school. I had a pottery class in high school. And if you don't get it centered or if it gets off-centered, it starts going... Bloom, 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 bloom right? And, and, and it, unless it gets back centered, it flies off and it normally splats on the floor against the wall, right? But you're the clay. You don't want to like splat on the wall or on the floor. You want to remain centered. And the Lord tells us to take communion to do this in remembrance. It doesn't make you holy. It just reminds you of him who made you holy. And it puts the Lord back in the center of your life and it puts you back on the center of the will. So he can continue to work out those hard spots of clay and continue to form you into what he wants you to be. And it makes everything centered. And so as we worship, just spend some time with the Lord. And then when you feel like you're ready to come up and receive of communion, you can come and take of the communion. And what, what will happen is you can pick up the cup. These guys are equipped, COVID equipped. And uh, they will hand you the wafer because it's in a pile. We don't want everybody touching that pile because we're all germy. No, <laughs> I feel like that. Like I'm, I, you know, I, I've been in contact with a lot of people. So today I'm wearing a mask for you guys, right? So, uh, but anyway, so that's how we're going to do it. And it's an odd time, but he's still the center, right? He's still the center. And so just spend some time worshiping. And as it continues on, the worship team will... Uh, go ahead and close the service. So I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we're going to celebrate in communion. You guys have an awesome week, though. Spend time with Jesus, and also think, God, what is on my heart? What extra can I reach out to and, and learn about you and, and, and maybe help others learn about you? Dear God, we thank you for the power, for the calling, for the access that you have given us, Lord, and may we just not look, neglect it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.